In our last lecture, we looked at the socioeconomic performances of ethnic minorities. In this lecture, we turn our attention to inter-ethnic cooperation. Peaceful and cooperative relations between ethnic groups are far more common than is large-scale violence. How do we explain inter-ethnic peace? Formal and informal institutions usually work to contain disputes between individual members of different groups. Then the question we need to ask ourselves, why ethnic groups? Well, ethnic groups are a response to the possibility of opportunitism. They allow for trust and reputation to be communicated among a group of people, even if they haven't met, allowing people to cooperate in a tit-for-tat prisoner's dilemma. Having an ethnicity allows you to trust others of your own ethnic group, or at least to be able to ask around about him or her before making a deal whereas you give only the lemon price to outsiders. So when can ethnic groups cooperate? The two answers are the spiral equilibria and the in-group policing equilibria. In spiral equilibria, disputes between individuals are correctly expected to spiral rapidly between the two parties. And fear of this induces cooperation on the equilibrium path. In the spiral equilibria, I will deal as follows. With members of my own group, I can determine their reputation and defect only if they are in a punishable phase for defecting inappropriately against a member of my group. With members of the other group, I defect only if their group is in the punishment phase, perhaps due to some transgression by a member of their group. In in-group policing equilibria, individuals ignore transgressions by members of the other group correctly expecting that the culprits will be identified and sanctioned by their own ethnic brethren. In the in-group policing game, I never play defect with members of the other group. When interacting with members of my own group, I defect only if they're in any punishment phase for defecting inappropriately against a member of either group. A range of examples suggest that both equilibrium occurs empirically and have properties expected from the theoretical analysis. Of course, this might be an over view of ethnicity. We can potentially argue that both inter- and intra-ethnic social capital exists, and that these inter-ethnic social and business networks can prevent ethnic conflict. By contrast, we can also claim that ethnicity is defined by networks. If you are part of the network, you are part of the ethnic group. So only intra-ethnic social capital can exist by definition. Perhaps though, from a different perspective, the arguments are reconcilable. When the sorts of intra-group mechanisms described begin to cross ethnic lines, then you get ethnic peace. Also assume that you have full information about all members of your ethnic group, but no information about others, perhaps other than the group that they belong to, they can admit that there's an impossibility of this assumption, but without this assumption, can the model still stand? When it comes to ethnic diversity and ethnic tolerance, we see that Anglo and Latin nations are the most tolerant. Individuals are more likely to embrace an ethno-racially diverse neighbor in the United Kingdom and its former colonies, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and in Latin America. The only exception in the Latin American case is Venezuela and Dominican Republic, uh, perhaps in oil-rich Venezuela where income inequality sometimes breaks along ethno-racial lines, and in the Dominican Republic due to its adjacency to troubled Haiti. Scandinavian nations also scored high. By contrast, India and Jordan are the least tolerant. In only two of the 81 survey nations, more than 40% of respondents said that they would not want a neighbor of a different ethnicity. This included 43.5% of Indians and 51.4% of Jordanians. Wide interesting variations occur in continental Europe. Immigration and national identity are big touchy issues in much of Europe as we discussed in earlier lecture, where ethno-racial makeups are changing. Though you might expect the richer, better educated Western European nations to be more tolerant than those in Eastern Europe, this is not exactly the case. 
France appears to be one of the least ethno-racially tolerant nations on the continent, with 22.7% saying they did not want a neighbor of another ethnicity. Former Soviet states such as Belarus and Latvia scored as much tolerance than much of Europe. Many in the Balkans, perhaps after years of ethnicity-oriented wars, expressed lower racial tolerance. The Middle East is not very tolerant. Immigration is also a big issue in this region, particularly in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which often absorbs economic migrants from poorer neighbors. Ethno-racial tolerance is low in Asian nations. Nations such as Indonesia and the Philippines, where many ethno-racial groups often jockey for influence and have complicated histories with one another, showed more skepticism of diversity. This was also true to a lesser extent in China. South Korea was not very tolerant, and it is an outlier here. Although the country is rich, well-educated, peacefully, um, and ethnically homogeneous, all trends that appear to coincide with ethno-racial tolerance, more than one in three South Koreans said they do not want a neighbor of a different ethnicity. Pakistan is remarkably tolerant, and it's also an outlier. Although the nation has a number of factors that coincide with ethno-racial intolerance, inclusive of sectarian violence, um, it's a location in the least tolerant region of the world, low economic and human development indices, only 6.5% of Pakistanis objected to a neighbor of a different ethnicity. This would appear to suggest Pakistanis are more ethno-racially tolerant than even the Germans or the Dutch. It is, of course, tough to gauge ethnic intolerance through just one metric. There are many ways we can express ethno-racial intolerance. The metric could suggest, for example, high tolerance amongst Americans, but low tolerance amongst Indians. It is entirely possible that other metrics could return very different results. This map may look quite different if we ask people whether they want, um, if they're going to be okay or they're all right having a member of a different ethnicity marrying into their family. Ethnicity, as we've discussed in our earlier lectures, is a social construction. It is a construction with significant implications for the world. How individuals perceive ethnicity, both their own and that of others, can be tough to measure particularly given that it's so subjective. So how do we study it? The Harvard Institute of Economic Research started to compare data from an array of different sources, national censuses, uh, CIA data, Minority Rights Group International, and it came together by looking at how can we understand ethnic diversity? One thing that the Institute's authors did with all the data was to measure what they call ethnic fractionalization. They gauge this by asking an elegantly simple question. If you called upon two individuals at random in a particular nation and asked them their ethnicity, what are the odds that they would give different answers? The higher the odds, the more ethnically fractionalized or diverse the nation. The greener countries are more ethnically diverse and the orange countries are more homogeneous. Now we can see a few trends right away. Nations in Europe and Northeast Asia tend to be the most homogeneous. Sub-Saharan African nations, the most diverse. The Americas are generally somewhere in the middle. Richer nations appear more likely to be homogeneous. Now this map is particularly interesting viewed alongside data that measures the frequency with which individuals in certain nations said they would not want a neighbor from a different ethno-racial group. Before we go further, however, there are a few important caveats. Some of the data is very old, dating back to the 1990s. Conceptions of ethnicity can change over time. And of course, the national makeups themselves can change due to immigration, conflict, demographic trends. It is entirely possible then that some of these diversity scores will look very different at present day. Another caveat is that individuals in different nations might have different bars for what constitutes a distinct ethnicity. In other words, the data on the map here could be seen as a measure of the perception of ethnic diversity more than diversity itself, especially the case given that ethnicity is a social construction 
Now, we, again, as, as mentioned, African nations are the most diverse. Uganda has by far the highest ethnic diversity rating, followed by Liberia. In fact, the world's 20th, 20 most diverse nations are all in Africa. There are likely many factors for this, although one might be the continent's colonial legacy. Some European uh, colonizers engineered ethnic distinctions to help them secure power, most famously the Hutu-Tutsi division in Rwanda, and it is stuck in present day. European powers also carved Africa into territories and possessions along lines with little respect for the actual individuals who lived there. When Europeans left, the border stayed, uh, forcing different groups into the same national boxes. Turning to Asia, Japan and the Koreas are the most homogeneous. Ethno-racial politics can be complicated and nasty in these nations, where nationalism and ethnicity have at times gone hand in hand. The lack of diversity perhaps informed these politics, although it's tough to say which caused which. European nations are ethnically homogeneous. This is, f at least to some extent, is one of the most interesting trends in the data. A number of now global ideas about the nation state, about national identity that's tied to ethnicity, and about nationalism itself originally came from Europe. For centuries, Europe's borders shifted widely and frequently, only relatively recently settling to what we see today, in which most large ethnic groups have a nation of their own. That developed painfully over a long period. And of course, there are some exceptions. Uh, in Belgium and in the Netherlands, for example. Nevertheless, in most of Europe, ethnicity and nationality are pretty close to the same thing. The Americas are the often diverse. From the United States to Central America down to Brazil, the quote-unquote New World nations may be in part because of their histories of relatively open immigration, and in some cases intermingling between natives and new arrivals, tend to be pretty diverse. The exception in South America uh, is the Southern Cone, where Argentines and Chileans, many of whom originally come from the same handful of Western European nations, tend to be homogeneous. Finally, we see wide variation in the Middle East. The range of diversity from Morocco to Iran is a reminder that this part of the world is much less monolithic than we sometimes think. Northern African nations include large Berber minorities, for example, as well as some Sub-Saharan ethnic groups, particularly in Libya. The diversity of Jordan and Syria are reminders of their internal complexity. Iran, with large Kurdish and Arab populations, is one of the region's most diverse. There are a few conclusions we can draw from the data. Foremost, ethnic diversity correlates with latitude and low GDP per capita. Measures of linguistic and ethnic fractionalization are highly correlated with latitude and GDP per capita. We can also suggest that strong democracy correlates with ethnic homogeneity. This does not mean that one necessarily causes the other. The correlation might be caused by other factors uh, in play here. The democracy index is inversely related to ethnic fractionalization when latitude is not controlled for. The idea is that in more fragmented societies, a group imposes restrictions on political liberty to impose control on the other groups. In more homogeneous societies, it is easier to rule more democratically since conflict are less intense. In general, it does not matter for our purposes whether ethnic differences reflect physical attributes of groups or long lasting social conventions or even a simple social definition. When individuals persistently identify with a particular group, they form potential interest groups that can be manipulated by political leaders, as we talked about in our early lectures. And those political leaders often choose to mobilize some coalition of ethnic groups, the us versus them. In other words, they're mobilizing a coalition of ethnic groups to the exclusion of others. Politicians also sometimes can mobilize support by singling out some groups for persecution, where hatred of the minority group is complementary to some policy that the politician wishes to pursue.
The functioning of democratic societies depend at least partially on social capital and the civic engagement of their citizens as they lower transaction costs and serve the common good. At the same time, modern societies are characterized by a great and growing diversity of their citizens regarding ethnicity. Responding to the growing interest on the implications of immigration for society, there's empirical evidence to suggest a negative relationship between ethnic diversity and social capital. The more diverse communities, the lower, the lower our residents trust, the smaller their social networks, and the less willing they are willing to involve themselves in the community. There's a large body of theories that focus on the effects of ethnic diversity or minority group size on inter-ethnic attitudes or prejudices, such as social identity approach, conflict theories, and threat theories. They nevertheless concur that large immigrant groups or rapid increases of immigration tend to elicit perceptions of threat and competition between ethnic groups. However, large outgroups raise, on the other hand, um, the opportunities for interethnic ties. Interethnic contact is, according to contact hypothesis, associated with more harmonious intergroup relations, at least if certain conditions are fulfilled. There's a diversity paradox. Ethnic diversity has negative and positive consequences at the same time. So the construct theory provides a sort of negative consequences. It suggests a general withdrawal from society in ethnically heterogeneous settings. By doing so, ethnic diversity is associated not only with a decline in interethnic trust, but also with less trust in co-ethnics and neighbors. Unfortunately, this does not explain how, that is, by which mechanisms the negative effects of diversity on social cohesion and engagement comes about. One could argue that in-group favoritism was the driving force. Residents of more homogeneous localities are more trusting and are more willing to cooperate with community members because of their shared ethnic identity. Another argument that can be drawn from conflict theory and group threat theories, that is there's a threat or prevalent ethnic stereotypes regarding certain groups of immigrants may hamper trust and cooperation in ethnically diverse settings. Another sort of consideration is asymmetric preferences and coordination problems might aggravate successful cooperation in ethnically heterogeneous communities. Finally, drawing on evolutionary theories and empirical findings on altruistic punishment, one can suggest that strong cooperative norms within ethnic groups and dense networks that allow for social control might foster cooperation in ethnically homogeneous contexts. This ends our lecture on interethnic cooperation. In our next lecture, our final lecture, we will be looking at future prospects for ethnicity.